Well, I never thought that Burr made a deal with the devil. Others may have thought so, but uh, he made a deal with himself. He wasn't like the others. He was called the first gentleman of the United States. He was the highest born of the founders. Jefferson's family was middling. Washington's basically was middling with a bit of money in it, and of course Washington married a great heiress, which is how he became our first millionaire. Uh, Alexander Hamilton was John Adams and that West Indian bastard, which he was, uh, literally. Burr came from, his father was president of Princeton, and his grandfather was, uh, grandfather, great-grandfather was Jonathan Edwards, one of the great divines. He was like the Protestant pope of the United States. So Burr came from this very grand family in New England, mostly around Connecticut, although he's associated with New Jersey. And uh, he was a classmate of James Madison at Princeton, which was then called, I think, the College of New Jersey. I think. So he was the only gentleman and took himself very seriously. He had a great sense of humor, too much so for the other founders who were very serious middle-class people with middle-class values. And he saw through a lot of the hypocrisy, I mean, don't think he didn't get the point to Sally Hamming and Thomas Jefferson and all men are created equal and there Jefferson is sitting with 200 slaves. I mean, it would be Burr who would make a joke about that and the joke would get back to Jefferson and Jefferson would be seething because Jefferson knew that he was not the pure creature that he tried to present himself to the world as. So Burr was the realist. And realists are always hated, particularly in a sanctimonious society of hustlers, which is what the United States has been from the beginning, uh, where the first law is, I won't uh, blow your scam, you don't blow mine. Uh, we each help the other in, in hiding out, hiding what we're doing from the public. Uh, Burr could play the game perfectly well, but I th he led on that he understood the depths of hypocrisy that he was dealing with on all sides. I think that was bothersome. He was very much uh, formed by Lord Chesterfield, who was a witty, satirical, Realistic, I use the word realistic, other people say cynical, because if you say it's raining, it means you're a bad person. You're not an optimist. You say it's raining. Well, only a bad person would say it's raining. You'd say there's little, there's a possibility of damp. But you won't say it's raining. Well, he's the sort of says it's raining. They didn't like that very much. And he also saw the world as a kind of great game the other founders, although to a man they were atheists or agnostics, very much children of the Enlightenment, they still had been heavily influenced by the Protestant divines like Jonathan Edwards. And they were sort of, they were always posing for posterity. From George Washington on, I mean, they saw themselves on future Mount Rushmore. They knew that they had done something unique in the history of the world in founding this country. So everything was for the record. And Burr was just making fun of them. And I think that maddened them more than anything, that he didn't take them that seriously. He has been criticized that he made no contribution at all to the Constitution, uh, to, the con to the debates that went over, whereas Hamilton was brilliant, and so was lesser degree it was John Jay. And, of course, James Madison is called the father of the Constitution. These three people created the Republic. And the Federalist Papers, which are their meditations on power, how to organize a state, are perhaps the best ever written in any country at any time. Burr, interestingly, made no contribution. He had a lot of things to say on the side about it. First of all, he didn't think the Constitution would last 25 years. Neither did Jefferson. Jefferson wanted a constitutional convention once a generation, about once every 30 years, go back and redo it. 
Jefferson said, you cannot expect a man to wear a boy's jacket. So he knew the need for change. Burr didn't think it very important. He thought that we will work out something once the jacket falls apart. The state is not going to, to unravel just because of a constitution isn't working. There was a strange moment when he came back to practice law after, his, after he shot Hamilton, ceased to be vice president, went to France. Exile, came back, practiced law quite successfully. When he was about 80, he married again and got caught in adultery by his rich wife, a young woman called Jane McManus from, I think, Paramus, New Jersey. So there he was at 80 being caught in adultery. But he was very merry about the whole thing. But he, was, he had a lot of disciples. As I show one, Charlie Schuyler, who turns out to be his illegitimate son in Burr. And they were walking by Trinity Church at the end of Wall Street. And some workmen were building something, adding to the church. Irish workmen, which were already rather suspect. They were Roman Catholic and Protestants didn't know what to make of Roman Catholics. This is before the period Irish need not apply, but uh, they were still regarded as a, something strange in the Republic and what sort of citizens they were going to be, nobody knew. And there's a Burr and uh, his illegitimate son just standing at Trinity Church watching these guys work. And Charlie, who was studying the law, said, well, in the end, what determines justice in a country like the United States? The Supreme Court had not yet seized power, as it has done in our time. Uh, where is the source of legitimacy other than we the people, other than elections? You can't have an election about every law. And Burr said, well, justice and the law will be determined by them. And he pointed at these Irish workmen working in Trinity Church. He said, what do you mean? They're not lawyers. He said, no, but they will vote. They will determine the laws of the country. I can't. Chief Justice John Marshall can't. They will determine it. Now, he could have gone into, and this is real life, he's actually quoted as having said this, he might have gone further into what he felt about the majority rule, which he's also on record as being highly suspicious of, as was Jefferson, as was George Washington. They didn't feel they needed the advice of a majority of their fellow citizens. But he saw what he's saying is, look, there are no absolutes. There are no fundamentals. There is the fact of the citizenry. And they'll determine what sort of state they want to have. You wrote this, but I'm going to ask you this question that you wrote for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, you like Burr, but he certainly cannot be regarded as a good man or philosopher of government. In fact, wasn't he one of the first professional politicians representing only himself? Much of the objection to Aaron Burr st started in the election of 1800. Thomas Jefferson was eager to become president, but you were supposed in those days to pretend that you didn't want it. But uh, Washington had served two terms. John Adams had served one disastrous term in the Federalist interest, and Jefferson was a Republican. Not that we had parties then, but that was loose groupings of people with different philosophies of government. And Burr really joined neither faction. He, he dealt with each. But what he had done in New York State, he got himself elected to the Senate from New York by the legislature. And he was getting ready for the election of 1800. And Jefferson had made a deal with him that could Burr deliver New York, Jefferson could certainly deliver Virginia in the South. And they would jointly uh, win the election. In those days, you didn't run, one was running for president, one for vice president. What you did, you took the top two, 
those who polled the most votes. The one who polled the most votes became president, and the second most votes became vice president. Uh, Jefferson had already uh, cheated Burr four years earlier, and the South was supposed to have supported him for vice president. And Jefferson, generally treacherous, went back on his word. Now the deal is as follows, that uh, they will both be running for president uh, with the understanding that Jefferson would, as they calculated, get the most votes, Burr would get second most and would become vice president, with the understanding that Jefferson, after one or two terms, would go the way of Washington and Burr would inherit. Burr was... Uh, interested in politics and not in faction, as they call political parties. Uh, so were the others, but the others were more hypocritical. Jefferson was desperately interested in being president. He would say he thought of the most beautiful reasons why he should be elevated, but uh, it was just all ambition. Burr was a great political manager, and what he did he extended the franchise. Only men of property can vote in any of the states. All right. What he did was he took immigrants, and New York was still the great hub of immigration from Europe. And he would, plant, he would get a house and plant a dozen immigrants in it, and they would have equity in the house, and thus became men of property. And he enrolled them in a society to which he himself did not belong, called the Society of Tammany, Tammany Hall, which was created really basically for Burr and these new citizens. Well, this drove the professional politicians crazy. He had stolen a march on them. He had all these brand new voters, immigrants, each man a man of property who could go and say, yes, I own you know, 42 Pearl Street. I live there. That is my residence. And I'm on the rolls, and I can vote for House of Representatives. Well, he had sort of doubled the franchise in New York City, which basically was, as it is today, pretty much New York State. So through Tammany Hall, he made Thomas Jefferson president. Unfortunately, they tied. Each got the same number of votes as the other. Jefferson thought, that Burr sh should step down and say he didn't want it. Burr said our agreement was I shall not lift a finger on my own behalf, that it is you who must become the president and I to be the vice president. I will not step down. But I will in no way help anyone to obtain this election. So Burr behaved honorably. He did nothing. He was just sat for us. I think they went to 36 votes were going on in the House of Representatives trying to determine who was to be the president. Jefferson was as busy as a bee trying to get votes from this one, votes from that one. Meanwhile, bad-mouthing Burr, saying that he was doing the same thing and Burr was up in Albany or someplace like that, miles away from the voting. So Burr behaved well. And finally, Jefferson squeaked through. And there they are, president and vice president. But because Burr had behaved honorably, Jefferson hated him. No good deed goes unpunished is one of the great laws of nature, at least of human nature. Jefferson never forgave Burr for behaving well. And always did. Burr was a man of his word because, again, there was the difference between the gentleman with his code and the prophet, to give Jefferson a polite word, the prophet of democracy, who didn't believe in democracy. But. And that, the bad blood began right then and there. And Jefferson then worked to totally eliminate Burr from the government. So that by the time of the 1804 election, when Burr should have been returned as vice president, uh, Jefferson had just driven him out of the administration, so Burr headed for New York, ran for governor. Alexander Hamilton said something despicable about him. Burr said, what do you mean by despicable? Hamilton wouldn't tell him. Again, the great gentleman believed in personal honor. 
the code duello, the, the duel. If, if somebody who thinks he's your equal says something so insulting about you, uh, you must call him out and have, have a crack at killing him or he killing you. Hamilton waffled on this, and Burr called him out and shot him. Now, here's the vice president of the United States who just killed the former secretary of the Treasury and is under indictment for murder in the state of New York, so he has to flee down the Hudson River and finally comes back to Washington where he's still vice president and presides over the Senate. And uh, there was, Jefferson was trying to get rid of a, of a judge. He was always after somebody, and they had a trial in the Senate over which Aaron Burr, vice president, presided. And Jefferson then goes on his knees to Burr, saying, you've got to find this man guilty. We've got to get him off the bench. This is the treacherous Jefferson. And uh, as it was, uh, the man was not kicked off the bench. But Burr was impeccable in, in conducting the trial. The Senate became a jury. And then Burr, at the end, he addressed the Senate, and he said, should, I have to paraphrase this, but he said, should the United States ever be in danger, its institutions, at the hands of a tyrant or bloody revolutionaries, its expiring days, moments, will take place within this body. This is the last refuge of the republic. And with that, I say farewell. And he walked out of the chamber and went west. Immediately, Jefferson charged him with treason for trying to separate the western states from the east, put him on trial in Richmond. Chief Justice Marshall presided. <laughs> Burr worked as lawyer on his own behalf. Burr <laughs> called Thomas Jefferson, the president, as a witness. You are to come to Richmond with your documents. Ducas tecum. And, of course, Jefferson was hysterical at this. Anyway, Burr was found not guilty of treason. Now you see, I've just, as briefly as possible, told you how somebody could be totally smeared if you have a powerful enough opposition between Hamilton on the one hand, whom he shoots in a duel, which Hamilton didn't have to fight, and Thomas Jefferson, who was smeared him to the day he died. You're not going to get a terribly good reputation. What, uh, you said that there was something in your research that the, the thing that most surprised you, that you found in your research, was, was his diary? No. I, or letters to his daughter? The journal that he wrote? Oh, no, no. What I said was I had to think of something as, as a novelist. What was it that Hamilton had said about Burr that was so despicable? That was the adjective everybody used. And... Hamilton wouldn't answer what it was. And I figured out, Burr wrote letters to his daughter as though she were a son, as though he were Lord Chesterfield, who did write letters to his son, in which Burr writes perfectly openly about his sex life. He's constantly picking up ladies, and uh, he's very, very busy, right to the end. And um, he, tr he also... he. He was a great feminist, probably the first, the only one in the founding of the country. And he, he had her learn Latin and Greek. He, he brought her up as a boy, and she was considered the most brilliant young woman of her time, at least in the Republic. And uh, she was the only person he ever cared for. I intuited, but I don't know, this is my novelistic invention, that there was a charge of incest which was per Hamilton was perfectly capable of that sort of thing. Hamilton really ran off at the mouth. Uh, but I have no proof. But I, it, it was a device for me. Joanne Freeman, who's a professor at Yale, has written a book called Affairs of Honor, which is brilliant. And she thinks that I am imposing a 20th century view on it, that indeed the code of the gentleman, which Burr had to live up to because he was one, but Hamilton was a nobody from nowhere, uh, didn't have to. So Hamilton's all the more prickly and goes out of his way to appear more gentlemanly than the gentleman. It was a whole matter of class. It was a whole matter of, uh, of, the, of a code. 
I mean, you couldn't find a duel with, with a newspaper editor who wrote a, gave you a bad review because he wasn't in your class. But the vice president could certainly do a duel with the secretary of the treasury, and that's what he did. Let's talk briefly about 1876. Um, you wrote in the afterword, you wrote, um, the year 1876 was probably the low point in our republic's history. And knowing something about what happened then is, I think, useful to us now at times, as times are again becoming rather too interesting for comfort. Now, you wrote that when you published the book. Um, 1976, yeah. How would, I mean... Well, with 1876, it, it's uh, Charlie Schuyler, illegitimate son, a very old man now with his daughter. They've been living in Europe, and they come back to the United States. It's the year of the centennial of the Republic. And Charlie is back as a historian. He's going to write about it. He's got a beautiful daughter who's a widow who needs to marry a rich man. And indeed marries... Uh, uh, Mr. Sanford, whom we have already met in Lincoln, as he was involved with Chief Justice Chase's daughter. So uh, I felt that um, 1876 was just was the low point in the history of the Republic until the year 2000. In 1876, Rutherford B. Hayes uh, was the choice of the Republican Party, which was the ruling party as it was the party of Abraham Lincoln, and they had had the presidency ever since Lincoln. Uh, Hayes uh, lost the popular vote to Samuel Tilden, who was governor of New York, who was the first Democrat to win in the post-Civil War period. However, the Republicans controlled a number of states, including Florida, always Florida, and so they saw to it they had troops to keep order in former slave states as well as places like Nevada. And although Tilden won by, I think it was some 300,000 votes, more votes than Hayes, they just switched it around. It went into the House of Representatives and there was a special commission in which a deeply bent Supreme Court justice uh, sells out the election to the Republicans. Curiously enough, a Supreme Court justice appointed by Lincoln. And so Hayes, who had lost the election, becomes president. So at the end of the book, I, the book was published in 1976, 100 years after the centennial, I said, I think times are getting very interesting again. This was during the time of the possible impeachment uh, of Nixon. Uh, and it might be salutary to read about it. Well, it's far more salutary to read about it in the year 2000 when uh, Albert Gore gets a half million votes more than George W. Bush and the Supreme Court forbids him to become president because they don't want him to be president and the ownership of the country is united against keeping him out. And so the loser becomes president, as happened in 1876. So I'd say we live in even lower times now than when that book was written. In, in Empire, there's such wonderful portraits of the five hearts, or those, some of the five hearts, Henry Adams, Henry James, and John Hay, um, who I found wonderful to read about, and, and so interesting and so, um, so wonderfully and wittily depicted. Was this a fun book to write? Oh, I enjoyed it very much, and it was... Um... Yeah, well, all, all of my characters were in order, and they made the American... They were the conscious founders of the American Empire. Jefferson knew pretty much what he was doing with the Louisiana Purchase, but this was something... This was European power politics, and there was Henry Adams and his brother Brooks Adams, Henry Cabot Lodge in the Senate, 
Theodore Roosevelt, the sharpest card in the deck, is, I think, Undersecretary of the Navy. And then there's Admiral Mann, Captain Mann, who had written a book on sea power, England and sea power. And his thesis was that the, to form an empire, particularly if you're an island nation, and he regarded that the United States is essentially an island, even though it's a continent, but we have two great oceans, one on one side, one on the other side, that by mastering the seas uh, through ships, you will need more and more bases for those ships across the two oceans in our case. You'll need, and to get those bases, you will need colonies in order to trade, in order to get from place to place. Well, the five hearts, as they call themselves, uh, sitting there in what is now the Hay Adams Hotel, which was the house where John Hay, later Secretary of State, and Henry Adams shared jointly a great house, uh, right across the street from the White House, and they decided, well, now's the moment. We must become a world power. And we were already masters of the Western Hemisphere, but that wasn't good enough. We debated a war with Venezuela, or with England. We might have lost that one, so we backed away from it. Then we decided, they decided, that we had a war with Spain, which was a collapsing colonial empire in Europe, and uh, very weak. And we would do it to free Cuba. We always fight these wars. We're a bit like Hitler, you know. He was always going to free the Sudeten Germans from the wicked Czechs who were going to conquer Europe. And so we would free Cuba, hence the Cuba Libra, from Spain. Well, they pulled it off. It was in the summer months when President McKinley was out of town and the Secretary of the Navy was out of town, and Theodore Roosevelt was in town. And he sent Admiral Dewey, not to Cuba, to the Philippines, which belonged to Spain. And then came the events of, of uh, the sinking of the Maine, big war scare. Uh, we go to war with Spain, sink their fleet out of, out of Manila, very easily. We get Puerto Rico, we get Cuba, we get the Caribbean in general. But the main thing we wanted were the Philippine Islands. This is a vast property off the coast of China and off the coast of Japan. And Admiral Dewey has a great victory there. And that's how the American Empire was born. And I have these four at its center, five very brilliant men, and we, I know their conversations because they wrote so many letters and diaries. And you can actually overhear them discussing how they're going to turn the United States into a great world empire. Because at the end of it, we had the Pacific Ocean, and we had our eyes on mainland China. And this was the quarrel that later developed in the Second World War between Franklin Roosevelt who was very pro-Chinese because he hated the Japanese because they were competition for us. China was falling apart. The Roosevelt, the Delanos, his mother's family, had been in the opium trade in uh, China. And Roosevelt also had his eye on China. They all had their eye on China. And Shanxi province, which is up around Manchuria, northern North China, was the richest spot on earth. It had the most, most iron, the most coal, things that they used then for power. And Brooks Adams, brother of Henry Adams, said, he who controls Shanxi province controls the earth. So the Japanese were aiming for it, and they got it in the 30s. They seized Manchuria. We wanted it, and we even got as far as the Great Wall. There's still wonderful footage of Marines, American Marines on the Great Wall of China. American Marines occupying Shanghai. None of this is in our history books, of course, but we, we, we have the evidence in film. Uh, so, so with empire, and I call it just bleakly empire, I show how we got it and who thought it up and how they pulled it off. You have Henry James speaking in much the way he wrote. Hmm. How did you um, how did you know 
what he sounded like. I mean, there are letters, but... It's envelopes. Well, you tell from the letters. You can, I knew several people who knew Henry James. And Ruth Draper, a uh, monologist who did dramatic sketches, I saw her in action, and she did a superb imitation of Henry James. And I'm something of a mimic, so I picked it up from that. Just read him, and you'll you start to sound like him. Um, oh, this is such a detail, but I found the scene with McKinley and his epileptic wife at dinner absolutely hilarious. <laughs> if you could just paint that little picture. Well, President McKinley was a, a man of great charm and sweetness of character. And he had an epileptic wife. And uh, so it meant at the White House, any state dinner, the president's wife is at one end of the table with the guest, male guest of honor on one side and the president's at the other end with the lady guest. On. But the McKinleys had to sit side by side. And he'd be just talking, and she'd be on his right, and he'd be talking to somebody on his left. And he could tell if she was having a fit without even moving she would make some little odd noises. And she'd be here having a fit, and he'd be talking to somebody here, and he'd take his napkin like that, and he'd just go like that and put it over her face as she would twist and gag underneath. And he would just continue, and nobody ever made any reference to the fact that Mrs. McKinley was, uh, had gone bonkers. That's so wonderful. Um... This was so interesting to me. Henry James says this to um, to Henry Adams, and, it's, and it comes up again, I think, in, in the Golden Age. Um, the, he says, the acquisition of an empire civilized the English, but what civilized, what, but what civilized them might very well demoralize us even further. Do you agree with this? Can you? Yes, I do agree with it. Um, well, Henry James thought, because he was an Anglophile and he was not a great enthusiast for the United States, which I am, though I cannot sometimes conceal my disappointment in the way our affairs have been conducted. James thought that acquisition of, of an empire, and starting early in the 18th century, had proved a civilizing factor in British life given them a purpose, given them something to do, something for younger sons to do, to be trained for. But he knew we wouldn't do that. And we never, I mean, we have a world empire as we speak. There's nobody being trained to run it. There's nobody being trained to do anything except make money on the NASDAQ or lose it. We don't learn languages. We don't know how to deal with other countries. We don't know any history. Well, the Brits at least had a ruling class, and they trained the ruling class to be rulers of India, of whatever it is that they happened to be in charge of. James understood the American venality, basically, greed, interest in, in quick profits, and no interest at all in other countries and cultures. So he said, where the British have been civilized by the possession of an empire, I think we will be further demoralized and he even went on to say, and, and what are we to make of the fact that we will be exporting Tammany Hall to the Philippines and to other countries that don't deserve our form of government? So he, he was very harsh. I remember somebody in the Washington Star, the paper owned by, the no, Washington Times owned by the Moonies, wrote, of course, Henry James said no such thing, Gore Vidal. Knows no history, does nothing about Henry James. And of course, I was quoting from a letter that James had written his nephew. Henry Adams. Um talks about history, he says, I've, I've, I've done with our history. There's no pattern to it that I can see, and that's all I ever cared about. I don't care what happened. I want to know why it happened. 
No, no. Henry Adams was our greatest historian, and his his books on uh, the administrations of uh, Jefferson and Madison, which is really about the Adams family too, are classic. And um, but he abandoned writing history after those volumes and became more interested in religion. But he said, uh, somebody said, well, why did you quit writing history? He said, well, I was never interested in what happened. I wanted to know why it happened. Couldn't find out? Quit. Well, I'm interested in what happened. I know there is no why. So you don't think there's a design to history? No, of course not. How can anything human have a design? We are creatures of, uh, we are reactive creatures. We are reactive to climate, to all sorts of things, which can't be predicted. I think you see patterns. I think you see patterns in the country, which is why I wrote seven volumes of narratives of empire, because I think I did grasp something about it. But no more. He wanted a mystical reason because he, he, he turned a bit mystic in later life, which I shall never do. And he thought, he saw the polarities with the Virgin as a relic of the Mother Goddess and also of Christianity, and the dynamo, which meant the modern world of machinery. And he was very, very uh, impressed by it. I think it was the World's Fair in St. Louis that showed a dynamo. And he saw these as the polarities of the human race, the instinctive gods and goddesses, and then the new machinery and what that was going to do. And he was trying to make sense of the two of them and in his later works and did not succeed. You said um, that when you chose, uh, you know, your plot where you want to be buried in Rock Creek Park, that it would be halfway between Jimmy Trimble and Henry Adams, and you said halfway between heart and mind. Um, did I say that? Yes, I think some Powell says. Yeah, did I? Yeah. I mean, is Henry Adams, you know, someone that, as a historian, or as a, in what way do you find him to be so important? Or what? Well, Henry Adams, not unlike what I've been saying about Burr, was uh, had a sharp and realistic eye. He understood the great men, being a grandson and great grandson of presidents. Uh, he was well suited to be the historian of the republic, which he was for a time. And uh, his skepticism is refreshing. He was totally without uh, hypocrisy. I mean, the education of Henry Adams is a very great book because it, he treats himself objectively. He makes no case for himself. If anything, he um, denigrates the character of Henry Adams. Henry Adams never realized, he writes in the third person, doesn't, did not realize what such and such meant. And... Um, that was his power, because most Americans do nothing but praise themselves. It's just part of the advertising ethos of the country. That's why I really have had so little connection with other novelists, American novelists, in my lifetime. So I don't want to read about them. I'm not that interested in them. And they certainly don't want to read about things like empires or republics. So I'm on a different wavelength. Well, I'm on the same wavelength, I think, as Henry Adams, minus the mysticism which came to him late and which I think came out of aesthetics rather than religion. When you were talking, you used the word uh, realistic, and also when you were talking about Burr and describing how he was a realist and how in, in the kind of society he lived in, you know, that people found that very irritating. Um, I was thinking about you. Well, if 
people were irritated by Burr's realism. They were certainly irritated by mine. I'm quite aware of that. Uh, I, I've found over the years that anything of a truthful nature that I have to say about our political system is immediately denied. Uh, I had my problems with the Lincoln Brigade when I wrote Lincoln. Uh, true story after true story, which they knew to be true. They, they denied, starting with details like his having syphilis. Well, for 17 years, he worked in the same room as William Herndon, his law partner. And uh, Herndon, if you don't believe Herndon, you'll, there is no Lincoln biography because he's the, our only authority. And why would he lie? He, he adored Lincoln. Lincoln, right up to a month or so before he was assassinated, uh, still favored shipping the black slaves that had been freed from the South out of the United States, preferably to Central America or Liberia. You can't say that. Everybody, the court, the court historians, as I call them, uh, just, they lie. And they say, oh, well, you say Ben, ben Butler said so, but he couldn't have seen him in March because there was an order that general officers couldn't come to Washington. There's no record he came to Washington. So you get all this quibbling, quibbling, quibbling when the certain main lines are very clear. And it's exhausting. Now you see, unfortunately, being a novelist, they say, oh, well, he's making it all up anyway. That's what a novel is. You see, it can't be true. It can't be true. I made a mistake by not inventing a new term. I knew, that's why I call them narratives of empire, which gets, at least I'm not saying that I'm writing fiction. I have fictional characters, but my principles are real, and I'm as close to history as, as I know how to be, and certainly as close to history as the people that I borrow from. After all, I have read more American history than anyone outside of an institution. One of the, uh, I don't know whether you caught any flack for this, but I thought one of the incredible scenes between a real, so-called real historical figure in FDR, well, they were both real people, but you invented a conversation between Hearst and Roosevelt with the line, true history is the final fiction at the end of Empire, right? Um, well, that conversation pretty much took place. It's the right time and the right place. Hearst did come to the White House. And he did denounce Theodore Roosevelt. I now forget what sources I used on it, but obviously biographies of, of each man include this collision. And uh, there's no typescript of what they said, but if you know what the gist of what they had to say to each other and why they hated each other, and that Hearst, I have perhaps more perceptive than he was in real life about the goals of history, about what history is. But he's the man who said, if there is no news, invent it. Well, if that doesn't cover inventing, if there is no history that conforms to your prejudices, invent that history, which is what most American historians like to do. So I think that's perfectly in character for him. And Roosevelt's vanity was so great, I mean, he really thought that he was a hero of San Juan and so on. And all Hearst was doing is that if I hadn't written about you in my papers, you would not be here in the White House today. As blunt as that, which is probably true. That's a very important theme in Empire and, and developed in uh, Hollywood as well about the role of the press in What's history? What's news? Who's creating which? And, well, who? It was with Hearst that it became official that if you didn't have any news, you'd invent it. Uh, if there was no war, you would try and get the United States into a war. And that the historians were going to follow you. I mean, remember, you know, Hearst almost got Adolf Hitler to write for him. 
I think he got Mussolini. And he really he was within in an inch of getting Adolf Hitler because he offered so much money. And Hitler, like everybody else, was interested in you know, Germany was pretty poor and all their money was going into getting ready for war. Uh, I don't think he got Hitler to write for him. Well, I know he didn't, but I, I mean, I don't know what, what, what broke it off, but I think Mussolini did write for him. Uh, Winston Churchill was always writing for Hearst. And Churchill was very funny on Hearst as a, as a boss. And he said, he's a sad, wise child, was Churchill on Hearst, which I have not used in the books. But Hearst created this whole, whole thing that news is whatever you can get away with. Then history, historians, quite correctly, want to go to primary sources. What's a primary source? It's a newspaper. I asked Arthur Schlesinger, after he had his little job in the White House, after he'd been at it for a while, Bobby Kennedy got him in, not Jack Kennedy. But he was allowed to watch things, and um, I said he'd been there about a year, and I said, well, what, what now that you've been writing about presidents all your life, what do you find working for one in the White House that you didn't expect? And he said, oh, primary sources. As a historian, we depend religiously on primary sources like newspapers of the day. He said, I read the New York Times and it bears no relationship at all to what is going on in this house. And I said, well, we must find other ways of writing history. I did not propose the novel to him. Can we just do a little bit on Hollywood? Right, right. Okay. Um, well, there was a scene, and actually this scene occurs, I think, both in Hollywood and uh, with, with Wilson talking about... Um, getting, preparing um, for going to war mm -hmm. and his speech. Um, first, first there's a scene where Blaze mm -hmm. uh, observes Wilson. It's very, very good. And I wondered where, you know, how you came up with that. Um, I've forgotten. But... Um, I, mean, I don't remember the scene. Then he's watching Wilson give this speech. Um, and and he talks about his tragic step and everything. Um, and the world must be made safe for democracy. And Blaze wonders, what is democracy? Well, uh, a lot of people wondered what Wilson meant by that. What do you think? It's rhetoric. You know, Wilson was a preacher. And uh, the world must be made safe for something, and we had been brought up in America to d dislike Kaisers and kings and monarchies. And we thought that uh, a country, once it had free elections, was going to be a democracy. Well, we've never been a democracy, and I don't know why we expected suddenly a, the Weimar Republic to be a democracy, which it wasn't. We weren't very good at seeding democracies across the world. But Wilson was a very persuasive speaker. I remember my father marched in the West Point parade at the first inauguration of Wilson. And he'd heard a lot of presidents, but he said that Wilson was the greatest orator that he'd ever heard. And the records of him, his extraordinary voice. But it's, it's that of a preacher. And great sort of uh, you know, cloudy images, and uh, he's not very precise. I don't think he would have, it's what Henry James was talking about, exporting Tammany Hall to conquer Germany. Is this a good thing to do? Well, we have seen the regime of Helmut Kohl is the result of an American Tammany Hall that we gave the Germans after 1945. So uh, our exports and the political line have not been very successful. I 
a little bit on, on Washington, D.C. Um, uh, what was James Burden Day's moral dilemma? Well, it was to take money uh, in order to run for president because he regarded a third term for Roosevelt as the end of the republic. He hated Roosevelt politically and morally. And all he had to do was absent himself from a committee meeting and uh, be paid off uh, for his campaign for the presidency in those days. $200,000 was like $200 million now. And so he sold out the Indians. And this guy was, puts up the money for him in a sense, can blackmail him, but what his moral problem is he should never have done this. The moral problem, is it better, in a sense, to take a $200,000 bribe that may make you president and keep us out of the Second World War, which you believe is an important thing to stay out of, uh, or is it better to... Uh, not take the bribe and let FDR get in and get us into the war. I find that an exquisite moral problem. And it ruined him. Can you give me a first sentence for that using his na the character's name? Maybe use the white whale. Well, the tragic figure in Washington, D.C. is uh, James Burden Day. He's a senator from somewhere out in the Southwest, and uh, he very much wants to be president. He regards Roosevelt as a potential dictator, which indeed he did become for a while, as Lincoln had before him. But more important, he wants us to stay out of the uh, European war. And he realizes that uh, he is a possible candidate. He has many admirers. Will Roosevelt run for a third term or not? And if he does try to run, could he be knocked off? Huey Long thought he could, but Huey was done in. So the only way he can be a viable candidate is to raise some money, and the only way he can do that is from some oil men. Uh, not by doing anything active, but by being inactive, going off to Canada, I think it was, on a trip, when a certain vote came before his subcommittee. And uh, the Indians were, were done in yet again, and he had his money to run. And this presented him with a great, between I alone can stop Franklin Roosevelt and the U.S. in the Second War, but on condition that I sell out the Indians to get the money to run to stop the third term. I mean, this is really uh, well, borrowed from, uh, from, from Greek tragedy, from the Oresteia. You obey one god and you disobey the other one. You're not going to win. City in the Pillar? Mm-hmm. Who is J.T., and why is the book dedicated to him? Everybody thought it was Jack Tevel, who was a fellow editor with me at E.P. Dutton, who suffered from aggressive psoriasis and was not a thing of beauty. And I thought how kindly I was towards psoriasis, that I would go out of my way to dedicate it to somebody who was... We had to mask him when he went out in public. The, the City and the Pillar was written, it's my third book. Much of it was written, I had already bought a place in Antigua, Guatemala, my monastery, which cost me $2,000. And I s settled in seriously to write. I published Willow, I published in the Yellow Wood. Been through my Anais Neen period, though she came down to Guatemala to stay with me. And 
I finished The City and the Pillar shortly after my 21st birthday, which would have been October 1947. It was published in January of 48. The publishers hated it, but uh, as it was immediately a bestseller, they overcame their loathing. In the interests of commerce, as they are prone to do. And it was a, a definite decision. Otherwise, I would have gone in, straight into politics, out to New Mexico, whose governor was a protege of my grandfather. And uh, I thought I'd go out to Santa Fe. I had a job on a newspaper if I wanted it. And um, begin a political career. Meanwhile, I had been so um, annoyed by the um, attitudes toward same sexuality. We don't even have a word for something which really doesn't exist, uh, which I'd encountered in nearly three years of the Army, where I met a cross-section of America and realized that uh, my countrymen, country persons, were totally deranged on the subject of sex. There was nothing that they believed to be true that was true. They thought there was actually such a thing as a homosexual person. Well, there isn't. There's a homosexual act. We know what that is. And a heterosexual act. We know what that is. There's no such thing as a person. And I had learned this being fairly observant. And uh, as a matter of fact, if you were quite young as I was going, in, I was in from 17 till 20, uh, you spent a lot of time dodging, uh, particularly up in the illusions. You, I'd go into a movie house, I always got myself in a corner wedged in because either on one side of you or on the other side of you, there would be somebody, as there were no women around, there would be somebody on the attack, you know, anybody. And there were a lot of slugging going on. And one was quite aware of the enormous powers of adhesion, to use Walt Whitman's favorite word taken from the phrenologist, male to male. And with a marvelous excuse there being no females around, it was of an enormous intensity. It was either that or going out with the ravens, which populated the Aleutian Islands. Ravens, by and large, appealed intellectually to our boys, but not, not sexually. Now, by the time I had finished my service in the Army, I'd realized a number of things. One is the total normality, naturalness, among mammals, of which we must characterize human beings, and others of their sex, whether it's male-male, female-female. And my annoyance became a kind of fury as I was confronting the world of New York as a writer, and fairly successful, fairly young, and seeing, I remember W.H. Auden was supposed to be on the cover of Time magazine, and he, the cover was killed because the editor had been told that Auden was a fairy. And then I watched the witch hunts starting, particularly in the theater. Tennessee Williams is a fairy. Oh, no, he's sick. Time magazine did a series of 52 attacks on him, and I, in turn, one year attack Time magazine, piece by piece by piece, their attacks on Tennessee. And I thought, this, this won't do. And I have one of those temperaments in which I feel I make the rules. I'm not terribly interested in uh, what popular opinion may feel about things. So I said, uh, I would, uh, to myself, I'm going to show the normality of all this. It's going to be tragic. People say, well, that isn't normal. At the end of it, they don't have a fight. Two boys who'd once been lovers, and one kill the other, or one nearly kill the other. 
And I said, yes, but in this society they would if one had followed uh, the usual course, been married and so on, and the other one comes back with the same feelings that he had originally. In a society as sick and as deranged as the United States was then, and may I say is today, uh, it would have a tragic ending. And I said, also, it's a romantic, it's a story of uh, a romantic temperament. And may I say from Romeo and Juliet on, they don't end terribly well, those stories. Uh, it was not about Jimmy Trimble, to whom the book was dedicated, or rather just to his initials. But he had been killed in the war, and I thought about it, and I thought, I'll see him again when the war is over. And flying back from the Pacific, I stopped off in Jackson, Michigan, where I had an aunt. And some people came over to her house, and one of the boys just out of the army said, you hear that uh, Jimmy Trimble was dead. And that sort of jolted me, and I thought, oh, dear, what, is that? what does that mean? Then I thought, well, what did that mean? That combined with my general rage about American sexual attitudes, which continues to this day, I thought, well, I will give up a political career. And my grandfather was crafting a beautiful one out there in New Mexico. I have a Spanish name, or a name, Vidal, okay, which is a name that many Spanish people have, Hispanics. Which is a great help in a place like New Mexico, and it's a place that was run by cronies of my grandfather. And I could have had quite a career there. And I thought, well, I am going to publish this book. Even though E.P. Dutton, the editor, one editor said to me, he said, you know, if you publish this thing, they will never let it, you forget it, and you will still be attacked for it 20 years from now. And I said, well, if any book of mine is remembered in the year 1968, 20 years from now, well, I'm doing pretty well, am I not? He said, you won't like it. I must say, I didn't like it. But the attacks were formidable, and I never regretted for one minute that I couldn't have a conventional political career. Or, as it turned out, a conventional literary career. This was the period in which Walt Whitman was just, you could just begin to teach him in school. They had to invent something for his... Uh, his attitudes toward sex, and so they invented a brand new adjective, homoerotic. Now, he wouldn't do anything, he's a great poet, but he'd sort of daydream about it, and that's what it is, it's just don't taste not for real. It's the only way they could sell Walt Whitman, they could get him taught. Uh, then, in January comes The City and the Pillar, in March comes the Kinsey Report, and he reports that we, now known as the greatest generation, we who had des destroyed the Axis powers and conquered the Earth, that something like 37% of us had experienced uh, a degenerate sexual act with, another, with a member of one's own sex. Well, that tore it. In the City and the Pillar, which the New York Times would not take any advertising for. Then comes the Kinsey Report, a scientific report, coming much to my conclusion. They wouldn't take any advertising for the scientific book either. And then the absolute uh, shrieks that went on in the press and go on to this day. It's not, I think in many ways things are worse now than they were then. At least there was a lot of ignorance around. Now there's everybody's got uh, opinions. And the fat people, as I like to think of my countrymen, uh, the fat people are really hysterical about sex in a way that they were far less so then because they had to make a living. They had, to, uh, they had other things on their mind. They didn't have the luxury of deciding who's a fairy and a good American and who is not. So that is the story of why it's dedicated to J.T. That was in memoriam to the past. But why the book was written, it was to change attitudes. Whether it did or not is not for me to answer. I shouldn't think much, but it certainly contributed to the to the discussion. You mentioned your <coughs> grandfather there, and in the new book of essays, I had a chance to read the one about the 
and uh, talked about what was his reaction. Well, he didn't read it. I uh, didn't have it read to him. Well, he was sorry, because he, th he saw that I could have a considerable career in politics. I was perfectly designed for politics in this period. TV was just about to come in, and TV became my medium, not only as a writer for television plays, but as a, as a performer, as a, um, as a voice. So, I mean, if ever a period was, was built for somebody who then went right out and made certain that he could not have a conventional political career, I'd done it. He himself, what I did was very gore, or at least like I like to think the proper line or the proper gores. Uh, they take chances and they do things that are unpopular. My grandfather was against the First World War and that cost him his seat in the Senate. He got back. His cousin Albert Gore in Tennessee, father of the vice president, he lost his seat over the Vietnam War and he didn't get back. I got no seat at all because of the city and the pillar and never regretted it for one minute. I mean, had it been one thing or the other, I would certainly have done the city and the pillar. If I could have managed both, I would have liked it. And there were times, 1960, I could, 64, I could have gone to the house of representatives from New York, but I couldn't have gone any further, and who wants to be? As Jack Kennedy said, the House of Representatives is a can of worms. I love that can of worms. It's been going around in my head for a <laughs> uh, Let's go back, and what's the origin and significance of the title, and how does it relate to the story? <clears throat> well, it's from the Bible. Genesis, isn't it? Yeah, the city, is the, the city of Sodom, which gets a bad rap. Actually, they were not rapists of males at all in, in Sodom. Uh, they, they were offering hospitality to some angels in disguise, but the 17th century translators into English got it mixed up. And uh, the pillar is Lot's wife, and Sodom is being destroyed. She's told if she looks back, she'll be transformed into a pillar of salt. Well, my main character, Jim Willard, does not progress in life. He remains fixed at a, with a, one erotic image, one love affair, one whatever word, one obsession. And uh, he never stops looking back. And in the end, he's destroyed. He, he doesn't, doesn't move on past uh, his boyhood friend. Hence the city and the pillar. Jim refers to unhappiness or loneliness as the tar of sickness. Hmm. Well, uh, roads were made of asphalt in Virginia back then. And it was always on those hot, desperate August days. We used to, we used to go out and chew a gooey asphalt from the roads, like chewing gum. And it did make you slightly ill, and it was always associated with, with heat and feeling rather depressed. And that was the tar sickness. character says each was able to sustain an illusion about the other, which is the usual beginning of love, if not truth. What role does illusion play in love? What's that from? That's a character in the book. Says that? that yeah. I've long since forgotten. But illusion is indeed part of uh, what we think of as, as a love affair. One gets an illusion about another person which often has nothing to do with the reality. 
and vice versa. And when two illusions confront each other, sooner or later somebody's going to wake up and somebody's going to be very sad at the awakening. That is the condition of the romantic temperament. So I think that was stating the obvious. Can we talk romantic temperament? Can we talk? Well, I've encountered it. I don't have one, but uh, I've had my share of illusions over the years. But not as many as most people, not as many as Anis Neen say. I mean, she had total illusions about everybody. You can see it in her diary. She meets somebody, she falls in love, she has an affair, everything goes wonderfully well. And then she starts to pick quarrels. And then gradually you see it all unravel. And she betrays them, or they betray her, or she feels she must betray them. They never live up to her expectations, which, of course, is the greatest illusion of all, that anybody should ever live up to your expectation of them. Who are you to have an expectation of somebody else's character? She was the perfect, uh, she was almost caricature of the romantic temperament. I learned a lot from her in what not to be. Also in that essay, uh, Thomas Mann had uh, uh, the book had had an effect on him. He writes it, but actually he talks about. Yeah, well, that was very, rather thrilling to me. When the book came out, I sent out two copies, fishing for blurbs, as all young writers do. I sent one to Isherwood. Well, I don't think much cared for the book. It was too tough for him. He really was into the world of illusion. But he saw its value as a kind of document and as a statement of position, so he, he praised it. Sent one to Thomas Mann, and he got back a polite letter with my name misspelled and uh, thanking me for my noble work, and I thought, well, that's that. And then a few years ago, I got a call from a biographer of Thomas Mann. He said, they've just opened up the Thomas Mann diaries, and they're Fisher is going to publish them in Germany. And he writes a great deal about the influence of the city and the pillar, which he read age 75. Can you imagine Thomas Mann, at the age I am now, reads a book which I wrote at the age of 21 or 2. And uh, my, I sent it to him in 48. He didn't read it until 1950. And he made notes each day as he read it on his, what he felt about it. And the love scenes at the beginning, he's wild about those. He always went on about, he's very guarded in the diaries, he goes on about his passion for young men, including, I think, his son. Uh, but nothing happens. And he even has sort of long, rather eccentric take on masturbation. And... He gives you a sense that he's never really done anything, but that is all that he ever thought about, which you certainly can tell from reading him, as stories like Tonio Kroger. And so he's delighted with the way I handled that with the two boys at the beginning, and then as the thing goes on, he admires it more and more. And toward the end, he has he doesn't object to the famous tragic ending, which... The entire, it seemed for a time, uh, faggot world of the day, to use the word used then, was down on me for having portrayed a tragic ending. And I said, but these endings are tragic, you know, I'm being, I'm being realistic. And later I, I, I changed the text a bit. So it's less melodramatic, but it still ends as badly as it would have done at that time. And then Thomas Mann, uh, you remember, he was the first great influence on me, a grown-up influence on my writing. I remember I was reading him when I was at Los Alamos, and I was 13 or 14. I was reading the Joseph series. And he's writing about the biblical Joseph, and I realized that what he was doing is what I wanted to do. I wanted to do the novel of ideas. We don't have a proper phrase for it in English, but... 
And put, setting something in history gave you an opportunity to actually talk about something other than I'm going to divorce you or I want custody of the children or I'm not paying alimony. Uh, the usual conversation in contemporary novels. So I was immediately attracted to his use of the past. I got all this, I think, the subtext of homosexuality in his work. And then when I came time to write The City and the Pillar, I used as a model for Jim Willard, kind of mysterious and mystifying to many critics' figure. I used Hans Kastorp, who was the protagonist of The Magic Mountain. It was largely an observer, but he's listening, and he's calculating, and he's figuring things out. But he doesn't do anything very dramatic. I don't, it's a certain sort of, protagonist who doesn't need to do anything. He's there to see things happen to others or to himself. And I was criticized for his not being more aggressive, this or that, but I thought he worked pretty well. And uh, Thomas Mann thought he worked. Thomas Mann does not recognize that I have borrowed his protagonist from Magic Mountain. So this is the peculiar chain from Hans Castorp to my Jim Willard is one jump. Thomas Mann then writes, I wonder if I could write a novel like this, referring to The City and the Pillar. Am I too old? Am I too remote from the world? Am I too, uh, have I been around enough, traveled enough? Because I like the form of it, you know, the openness and the way you can deal with many different things. He said, I think I'll look at an old, sh take out, an old short story called, I think, The Scoundrel, something like that. Well, he did. And it became, I think, his most charming novel, Felix Cruel. And so Hans Castor becomes Jim Willard. Jim Willard becomes Felix Cruel. And as I point out how nice it was that Thomas Mann, at the end of his life, could write such a happy, youthful book and name the hero Felix, which is the Latin for happy. That's great. I'm glad I, uh, <coughs> glad I caught that just a bit. Yes. Um, one or two more. Uh, this doesn't necessarily relate to the book, but I'm curious to know what the origins of what we know is romantic love are? Well, romantic love, uh, Dennis de Rougemont did a book about it, which came out, it was a very popular, effective book back in the 1940s. Uh, who knows where it begins? What's the difference between a novel of lust and obsession and a novel of romantic love? It's generally thought that romantic love, as we more or less think of it, evolved in the uh, 12th, 13th century with the troubadours in the south of France in which they would idealize a lady, usually the, the wife of their overlord, and they would write love poetry to her without much sex in it or without much hope of sex in it, in theory anyway as it was to the boss's wife, in a sense, that they were writing. And there was a whole tradition of romantic love, which had all kinds of rules and regulations. We get it in Japan, too, with Sei Shinagen and Lady Murasaki, and this is another romantic tradition, but a very different culture. And then the romantic ideal really starts about the 1300s, and then there's a sort of gush of romantic poetry that goes on and on. We see bits of it in Shakespeare. You see it, uh, the Lake Poets, Wordsworth. And there's a long line of it. It's just the passion for another person, whereas a classic poem would be the passion for your republic or for your tribe or for your nation or for your, for your god. The idea would be for somebody else of the same sex or another sex 
It would have been pretty far out before 1300, although the Romans and the Greeks both wrote love poetry to, uh, to their beloved, much of it uh, to the great embarrassment of te- people teaching Latin and Greek to schoolboys in the Western world. I just wanted to, well, yeah, just, I was going to do one more. But yeah, don't forget about the repercussions on oh, one's right. career. I think that's important. Mm-hmm. Talk about the New York Times and Well, the fallout from the city and the pillar still goes on. And it has now been, what is it, 54 years, 53 years since it was published. Uh, no, the hysteria uh, was very, very great. And uh, the daily critic of the New York Times, Mr. Orville Prescott, said that he would never read, much less review a book of mine in the Daily Times. And so seven of my books went unreviewed in the Daily Times with rather nasty reviews in the Sunday Times. Time and Newsweek followed suit, so I was totally blacked out. Luckily, I had England. So I was built up... A fair reputation there and audience, but it's a small country. So I was driven into television, which they didn't bother about to review. So I was safe from attack. And then I went to the theater, the movies, and so on. And by the time I came back to the novel, I had to quit for 10 years. I quit in 54 with Messiah. And I didn't come back with a novel until 64, with Julian, that was 10 years of doing everything, which was kind of fun, but that would have been essential years for me as a novelist when I was not allowed. I was blacked out. This often happens in America, but you're not supposed ever to mention it, and you're not supposed to survive it. I think it hurt many people's feelings that I did survive it. John Horne Burns, was, who wrote The Gallery, the best of the war novels, he was driven out of America by the reviewers, took to drink and died in Florence. And I could give you many, many cases like that. It's a venomous machine. But if you survive it, you become a lot tougher than they are. And I went on, and I paid no attention and did things in my own fashion and attracted... Largely due, I think, really to my presence on television and uh, and success in the theater and the movies. Uh, I just had moved into another category, and which they could then dismiss as I was a popular writer, and popular writers are never any good, except, of course, when they are. And so I need not be taken too seriously. But by then, it was too difficult to ignore me. But they could still be as they are to this day. I mean, the hysteria that the Golden Age inspired wasn't just political. That was half of it. The other one was we were going right back to the city and the pillar. How dare someone like that criticize the greatest nation in the country, as Spiro Agnew used to say. Um, You pay a heavy price. America is that sort of country. But if you survive it, you know... As the French say, méfiez-vous, watch out. What brings Myra to the Academy of Toronto and modeling? Movies. Myra is a child of the movies. And perhaps the film critic, uh, Parker Tyler, who was totally unknown at the time. He was known to a very small group of dedicated movie lovers. And he wrote in a magazine called View, and he'd written a surrealist novel with Charles Henry Ford, who's still alive, called The Young and Evil. 
So she's hipped on him and on the movies, and she has Uncle Buck Loner out there who has the Academy of Drama and Modeling. And so she wants to go out, and I think there's some money involved. And, but she really wants to soak herself in Hollywood in the great days and have a very good time and drive her Uncle Buck crazy. And it wasn't until I was halfway through the book that I figured out she'd been a man, which added, I think, the word in the English departments used to be resonance. A certain resonance was added to the, uh, to the story. Then in Myron, which I think is even, for me, rather funnier than Myra, she comes, she's a man again, but she then starts going, he, he is inhabited by Myra and Myron. And the two fight a battle for their common body, which I don't even dare visualize what it looks like after her famous breasts had been removed on, in a car accident. And uh, I just don't dare think what she must look like. But Myra wins, as she always does. What is Myra's uh, messianic mission? Well, she wants to, she's bored with the two sexes having been both herself. And, you know, she found a plus here and a minus there as she drifted back and forth between the two. She, she sort of was fun-loving Amazons is what she really wanted, which was turning boys into girls. And she makes a couple of experiments along those lines which don't turn out, to, her experiments don't work very well. I mean, we cannot say that her career as uh, the creator of a new sex, a new world, a new human being is not crowned with success. Her fun-loving Amazons are terribly sullen and uh, don't in the least like what she's done to them. But she, she's triumphant. She just rises above it. She is deity. Who is Dr. Randolph Spencer Montag? So you can well, as one critic says, Montag comes after Sontag in the German language. If it isn't Sunday, it's Monday. Uh, he's just uh, her dentist and mental therapist. I guess what I was just... It, it, the, the narrative is her... He gives her the assignment of this is her notebook. And, and that's oh, well, he, uh, Dr. Montag is both her dentist and her mental therapist, and he says that she must write down uh, her thoughts. And uh, a lot of the book, uh, on my part, was a parody of the French New Novel, particularly Panget and uh, two or three others that I was sending up, in which the object must be just to totally absorbed and got round and round and repeated and repeated. And I loved the theories of the French New Novel because nobody could live up to them, but they would try. And um, well, it has a lot of levels to it. When the book came, there was a marketing, uh, what was the marketing plan for the, the Well, it was kind of overwhelming, the response. Um, knowing that the New York Times would go all out to destroy it, as they still were doing from time to time to me, even though the editor of the Sunday book section was a friend of mine, I made a deal with him. I said, um, I don't want you to review the book. And I'd refused to write for the Times, and they were always after me. I said, I'll write something for you. This will be a trade-off. So I reviewed on the cover uh, Evelyn Waugh's military trilogy. That was my payoff. And their payoff would be that they would not review Myra Breckenridge. I then said, let's announce it for, let's say, May, and bring it out in February. By the time they get around to reviewing it in May, it'll be a bestseller, and there's nothing they can do to stop it, which is exactly what happened. But the New York Times, being the New York Times, I was betrayed. 
They got two or three journalists in-house to get together to review or to attack the book, by which time it was number one on the bestseller list and there wasn't anything they could do about it. So that was, I think, a very successful marketing plan. Then there was a, on the cover of the book, there was a cowgirl holding a hat in sort of chorus girl outfit. And she was actually a, I don't know, 30-foot high statue in front of the Chateau Marmont Hotel where I used to stay on Sunset Strip. And she used to revolve round and round. It was a great sight in Hollywood. So Jim Moran, who was a, a press agent, was hired by Bantam Books to take this on a truck, this huge statue, and go from state capital to state capital and present the statue of Myra Breckenridge to the governor of the state. Now, the governors of most states will do anything to get their picture in the paper, so every governor was standing in front of his state capital saying, no, 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 we don't want this on our capital grounds. So that was a plan that worked out very nicely, which I had nothing to do with, but I applauded it. We talked about that in L.A., yes. <clears throat> Um, <clears throat> the movie, do you want to talk about? No, I have never seen the movie, and I have no intention of seeing it. I had to watch about five minutes of it on television. When The Best Man was out, I went on to a Fox program, and the woman had decided that she was going to show some of Myra Breckenridge to show what a terrible writer I was, a terrible person. And there was a scene with... Um, May West and I think Rex Reed. I'd never seen any. I'd read the script, which I'd blacked out. And suddenly I have to sit there waiting to go on and listen to five minutes in which the word gay, a word I never use and was never used in the book or in the script, is used about eight times. I was gay. I mean, it's like listening to really cretins in a madhouse. And I was reminded again of the sickness of my nation. Myra has this uh, cult following, it seems. And I think that after the movie got a late night TNT rerun, you gained many more. Myra gained many more young, multicolored, and many earringed. Fans. Well, I hope that the essential uh, blessings that flow from Myra will wash away their sins. I think she comes to the conclusion, and I suppose any fair-minded reader would, that she is God. And we all know what he's like. He's pretty awful most of the time, but he has his occasional good moments. He's also absolutely uh, unpinnable down. Uh, like Myra, you don't know where her mind is going to take her next. She's a, she is a creative force as we suspect deity must be, if we are the result of a creation. So she is everything. But she transcends the merely human. I mean, the human is, is just a layer for her. So she's pre-Christian. You'd have to think of her as something that uh, was working its way around Mount Olympus or uh, possibly Shiva the destroyer. Um, I wondered if you could talk about the parallels um, between Washington, D.C. and Hollywood and the connections. Well, Washington, D.C. and Hollywood, aside from being two titles of books in my 
narrative of empire theories. Uh, there is a uh, symbiotic relationship, and it goes back a long time. Well, a long time, as long as Hollywood's been around. Uh, Woodrow Wilson, at the time of the First World War, saw the uses of Hollywood. He had pretty much an isolationist country. You must remember one thing about our wars, is the American people have never wanted to go to war with anybody. We didn't want to go in World War I. We didn't want to go in World War II. We didn't want to go in the Korean affair. We didn't want to go into Vietnam. This was all done by our rulers. And they, in turn, are, do it for the banks. They do it for corporate America. They do it for the defense industries and so on. So most of politics during my lifetime has been the rulers of the country getting the people excited enough to go to war and get killed uh, so that uh, Standard Oil can collect their royalties in Costa Rica or wherever. Well, it was hard going for the rulers to get people to go fight in Europe in a war between France and Germany. What were we doing in that war? That's World War I. Suddenly, Hollywood appears, and everybody on earth is watching the movies. The peasants in China, who don't, can't speak any language but, but dialect, understand Charlie Chaplin as well as the intellectuals in Paris. Here is an instrument. I don't know who first grasped it, but I know the first president to use it was Woodrow Wilson. He was hell-bent on getting us into World War I. He was up against an isolationist uh, press, Congress, people. He got hold of a great PR guy called George Creel, and he sent him as a sort of unofficial ambassador to uh, Hollywood with instructions and all kinds of carrots and sticks to the movie makers to make movies demonizing the Huns, the Germans, who were eating babies and raping nuns and uh, were subhuman people. And Creo was good at it, and they, we turned out so many films demonizing the Germans and glorifying the French and the English that he really started. Wilson, Woodrow Wilson himself appeared in two of these movies as Woodrow Wilson. These were all silence, you know, but there's Woodrow Wilson shaking the hand of the hero or heroine, and then you see, you know, a, a title... Uh, I am, I am President Wilson. I am happy to greet you and that you are going to fight for freedom against the Han. So he got his war, which was the object of the exercise. Well, nobody looked back after that when they realized radio, of course, was a great medium. So indeed, still were newspapers, but Hollywood was irresistible. The movies were irresistible. They were universal. And it was only natural, then comes election time, comes our era. Movie stars have a lot of money. Movies have a lot of money. They can finance campaigns. Politicians are such hicks. I mean, they're so thrilled to meet movie stars. I can remember when Frank Capra used to come to town to open one of his uh, sentimental political films in Washington, D.C. And, oh, everybody's so thrilled. Movie stars in our town and Everybody went crazy over them. We didn't like the movies because we thought his pictures were silly, but uh, we certainly liked the glamour and the attention. And it worked both ways. You saw the Clintons, they couldn't keep, uh, keep away from Hollywood. First it was money for, the, for them to raise for campaigning. And it was attention. Barbara Streisand with one concert can raise a million dollars for you and uh, attract the attention of the country. So it was perfectly logical that, that one would use the other, and each would use the other. And finally, it came down to, after a series, our rulers picked a, a series of um, duds for president. Lyndon Johnson did not turn out terribly well, even though he was potentially was a great president, but he got bogged down in the war. Nixon was plainly certifiable and a great embarrassment to the nation. 
Carter could not set a foot right. And they finally said, well, let's just hire an actor to play the president. And they got Ronald Reagan, who, contrary to uh, propaganda, was a grade A actor. He's not a grade B actor. He was one of the top five box office stars in the country when he went into the army, which meant that uh, he, he didn't go overseas. He went from Burbank at Warner Brothers over to MGM in Culver City. That was his war duty and made training films. And then 13 years of flacking for General Electric saying the communists are coming. Same speech he gave for eight years as president. And that scientist summed it up. So there, here I am with two books, Hollywood and Washington, D.C. And I know all this, but I haven't quite put it together because Ronald Reagan hasn't come along yet to, to put, as it were, uh, panache on it, meaning a plume. Isn't there a line that I read that um, uh, where you tell us that Reagan was asked, somebody said something about how can, how can an actor be a president, and didn't Reagan say? Well, no, Reagan was, you know, he did. He was very smart. He was not, wasn't, he knew no history, he read no books, he thought no thoughts, really, but he was an intelligent operator and a great careerist. And somebody said, how on earth could an actor know how to be president? And he, he said, quite correctly, he said, if you don't know how to act, you cannot be president. And I think everyone from George Washington on would say amen, Washington being one of the greatest actors we ever had. He was majestic. Well, you just don't come by that because you're born that way. It's because you work it out. You work out a performance, which Washington did, Lincoln did. Lincoln was the greatest stand-up comic probably that we've ever had. And uh, most of them have great histrionic gifts. But here was somebody just out of acting who showed how easy it was to be plausible. To be plausible and sound sincere. Helen Hayes, first lady of the American theater, as she was always called, from Washington, D.C., nice woman. Lifetime Republican, very, very right wing. She voted against Reagan. Somebody said, but Helen, he's just what you want, you know, conservative and so on. She said, yes, but he's an actor, and I don't want an actor. And I said, but what? You of all people, the queen of the American theater? She said, look, we're paid for one thing, to project sincerity. I don't know who he is. Nobody knows who he is because I don't know who's writing the scripts. When I play Queen Victoria, everybody knows I'm not Queen Victoria, so I have to be convincing as Queen Victoria. And that is done for me by my, by my author and my director. I don't know who's directing Mr. Reagan, and I don't know who's writing that script. And I'm voting for uh, whoever it was who ran against him that year. Smart. It was very shrewd coming from one actor to about another. And giving the writer credit. <laughs> well, that was, she was in the theater. <laughs> she wouldn't have in the movies. Matt, are you hanging at the door there? No. Okay. Um, And speaking of comparisons, like Washington, D.C. and Hollywood, um, what about um, the American Empire and the Roman Empire? Well, that's, uh, people like to make analogies between the Roman Empire and the American Empire, but I don't see any, really. We're the era of science, mostly, and most of our history has been conducted in the great burst of scientific activity which changed all travel, all communications. Everything has been changed. So I don't know how you'd begin to compare the two, except that things go faster now. The Roman Empire had 500 good years. If we have another five or ten, I'll be surprised, you know. Um, Henry James wrote, It is a complex fate to be an American. Well... Henry James was, tended to be right about such things. He also tended to be not very specific. I would like to know more of the complexities that he had in mind. 
It depends on what kind of an American you want to be. He was an American who did not like the United States. I'm an American who does like the United States, more or less as it was intended and as it was when I was growing up in the capital and as we thought it was, at least through the Second World War. And then since then, I can't say that I really like anything about it. The governance of the country, I mean, it's a lot has been lost, and that is complicated. You, I know people <clears throat> have often said to you, um, you know, if you, you know, they might even ask, you know, do you consider yourself an American writer? And if you consider yourself an American writer, why are you living in Italy if your subject is America? And I'd just like to hear the way you answer that. Well, I suppose there is an element of paradox that I am probably the most American novelist of my time. And I mean that in the sense that my subject is the United States. And it's the whole thing. Uh, I mean to include multitudes. And uh, I even have at times, I'm not terribly romantic, but I have a sort of Whitmanesque view of uh, the country. And so uh, it's all there, but it's in my head. I don't have to live in it. You see the problem, you see the split. Anybody who's watched this much of this program can see that I am interested not in myself and my career. I'm interested in the fate of the country and the civilization to which I belong, or the civilization that I would like to see develop in the country in which I was born. Uh, that's in my head all the time, and that's what I write about all the time. When you can see that if I lived in the United States, I would be, I would never write a line. You've seen me out there with the crowds. I would be out speaking from one end of the country year after year until I dropped dead. I live in Italy because I'm left alone, and I have my library here, and that's all I need are the books, my head, and to be left alone. If I'm in the United States, I don't leave them alone. What about the idea of psychic distance that James talked about? Do you feel you get a different perspective by being just a little bit... Well, you get a perspective, certainly. You're not... Uh, but It's different from what it was in his day. I have CNN. I'm, I'm watching exactly... The, I have the Herald Tribune. I am reading and watching exactly what... I would if I were living in Omaha. So wh where, where is the distance? I'm not distant. It's right on top of me. Henry James could live in London and never see an American newspaper, and there was no television, or, and he wouldn't have wanted it either. He contemplated Americans in America, and he was brilliant on the subject from time to time, but he had to put them in a European context to dramatize them. So that's why Europe was much more useful for him than it has been for me. I, except for the judgment of Paris, I don't think I've ever written anything about Americans in Europe. And if I did, I would feel, you know, he always said, oh, the poor innocent Americans. And I would say, oh, the poor innocent Europeans when we get loose among them. In, uh, in Washington, D.C., you have a character um, named Clay Overbury. There are certain things about him that, that resemble um, <coughs> JFK. Did you intend that, or is it just a type of personality? And what was the reaction of Camelot to, to that book? Um, well, Clay Overbury... Uh, in some ways, is suggestive of Jack Kennedy. He's, uh, 
but instead of having a rich father, he has a rich father-in-law who wants to make him president, and he rises and rises and gets rid of his wife along the way. And there are aspects of Jack, but uh, it wasn't about him. If you're going to do make Jack a protagonist of a novel, you'd have to start with the father, and you'd have to start with that family. That's the Kennedy story. That's his background. Well, Overbury has no family, and he's, he's totally an independent operator. I had a letter from somebody from some very right-wing magazine that I was surprised. Human Events, is there something called that? Um, some editor there saying how much he'd like these books, and, uh, and particularly the character of Clay Overbury. And he said, but of course, I've been covering Washington, D.C. all my life, and I've met him 10,000 times, so I don't think it was all that unique. I do know that when Ken Galbraith, a friend of mine, and of course, Jack made him ambassador to India. He reviewed Washington, D.C. for uh, the Washington Post. So there will be those who say it's a Romana clay and that it's uh, clay over, it resembles this one or that one, but he doesn't. And he said carefully, making sure that the reader would not identify him with Jack. Nor would they, because Jack's activities were not known in, in those days. Forget the context, but you said Americans can't understand me. They want mirrors. I'm a window. Mm, I didn't say uh, it was not about Americans. I said that uh, there is a problem that a certain a certain sort of reader has with me, with my writing, is that. Um, they're used to writers who are mirrors so they can see themselves reflected in the text. And I'm not a mirror, I'm a window. You can look out of the window and you'll see some of the world that you hadn't seen before. And that is my function, is to try and reveal as much of, of that world as I can. Those writers who write entirely about themselves seems to be about 99% uh, are acting as mirrors, assuming that their reader is going to be just as fascinated by them because the reader is fascinated by him or herself. That's all I meant, is that anybody who's going to show you something that you hadn't seen before uh, is going to have a difficult time. Most people read just to have... Um, superstitions confirmed. It's amazing how few people want to read anything that, from which they might learn something. I have a good friend, a very brilliant woman in the show business, agent, and I gave her burr when I wrote it, and she said, what do you give me that for? I don't know anything about him. I said, well, you'll learn about him if you read it. Oh, well, she said, I don't know anything about that period. And I said, you have no curiosity in knowing anything? No. Well, this attitude, as we can thank our educational system for having made our people totally incurious about everything. What they don't already know, they do not want to know. Now, when you start out with that as an audience, you are going to have a very difficult time unless you write about five people. You can write about Judy Garland, you can write about Marilyn Monroe, you can write about Jack Kennedy. There are about five people that they've heard of. And you just tell them the same story, oh, Daddy, tell me about Marilyn Monroe again and Joe DiMaggio. Oh, I love that story so much. Just tell me again about it. Like children wanting the same story over and over and over again. It is interesting how we've made, um, how movie stars have become our gods and goddesses. You know? Well, they're the only people anybody knows, you know. Someone asked you, you know, what is it like to be Gore Vidal, or do you have fun being Gore Vidal? And you said, um, well, I didn't set out to be Gore Vidal. And I wondered who then 
did you set out to be? Well, I wanted to go in politics, so I wouldn't have been a writer. Um, I wanted a different a different career, but since I was stuck with the one into which I was born. The other I was born into in the sense I was part of a tribe, family, and would be fulfilling family uh, family obligations, and being born a writer meant I was going to have to do something else, which is far more interesting, basically, in the long run. I've noticed that uh, justice seems to be a very important concept, and, and honor seems to come up. I mean, obviously power and how power is seen, but well, the idea of honor comes up. Uh, Hardly an American theme, is it? Yeah. And that, of course, was what attracted me to um, Aaron Burr. Can, can you say the, that? You well, say? the idea of... Um, they're sort of twin ideas that possess me, it seems. When I ponder the rare occasions, I think about what I've written and done. One is honor, and what does it mean? What do you do at the sacrifice of your own interests, which would be of use to your country or to others? And then justice, which really bothers me more than anything else, injustice. I mean, the, the fact that 6.6 .6 million people are in prison or in what they call correction, 3% of the adult population. I wake up at night raging about that. I don't think any other American bothers. So they're bad luck, or they deserve to be. They wouldn't be in prison unless they were bad people. Probably take drugs, you know. People who take drugs should be killed. That's the average American attitude. Well, mine is that nobody should be put in prison for taking drugs. Hospitalized, maybe, or thera you know, given therapy, given help. But what right has the government to determine what I smoke, drink, inject? What government has this right? Uh, none. But it's a means of keeping control over the people. Now we get back to power. And now we get back to injustice. A totally unjust system that a kid who is caught three times smoking marijuana can be life in prison uh, without any hope of parole, uh, whereas uh, a, a serial murderer can get out after eight years or something like that. There's a whole formula for him to escape. He's dangerous. The person who smokes marijuana is not dangerous. It is stuff, it is injustice like that that I find gets me going more than anything on earth. Why does it do it? Well, that comes the other one. That comes out of a sense of honor that if you are in a position to speak out and to change people's minds and you can take to the airwaves or write or do something, then you ought to do it. Most people I find try to get them to do anything. They're so terrified of the government. They're so terrified of popular opinion. They, don't, they won't speak out. And they become sort of anesthetized to their times. So I often feel I'm just dealing with some of my best friends. They're zombies, moral zombies, because they've been frightened to death. But where do you think this comes from in you? I don't know. I'm not my subject. I don't study myself. Um... If you were interviewing yourself, what questions would you ask? If I were interviewing myself, uh, as you suggest that I might do, what questions would I ask myself? Why is it that whenever I have a great success at anything, I leave town? I'm one of the few people, when he has a hit play on Broadway, I'm out of town the next week and don't come back till it's gone from the theaters. 
or a successful book or whatever? Uh, I'd love to know the I, I can't answer it. I, I, I would ask myself that. I think it's a sense of completion or that ghastly word that they use on television all the time now. Closure. Isn't that the dumbest word? We have so many dumb words floating around, but I suppose it's a, it's a desire for closure. All right, I've done this. I put the play on. And the thing is working. Or it's failed. I, I, I leave town when they fail, too. Um, move on. I'm guessing at why. But not, it's the only thing that occurs to me that seems at all significant. Perhaps you're more interested in the process and the problem solving. Well, I think that would be true of any artist or any reformer. Right. Well, I first came to Rome in 1939, and uh, as I've already described, I was quite... I felt I was home. Then I came back in uh, the 50s to write Ben-Hur, and I, it was May time, and I was got Roman fever all over again. Thought, I really got to live here again. Then went back, and... Um, by 1964, I, I could have been elected to the House of Representatives from upstate New York, and uh, I decided I didn't want to run again, this time for fear I'd win. And uh, I was going to go back to novel writing, I was going to go and finish the novel of Julian, which I'd begun years before. So it was either Rome or Athens, and Athens was far too hideous a city the modern Athens, and um, so I settled in and be a Julia. And duly wrote Julian, and then uh, got an apartment and sort of settled in and began to go back to novel writing. And it was a place to be away from. I, I missed my house on the Hudson, but by 64, I think it was, I'd sold that. And then we got this place down here about 30 years ago, because Rome got to be too noisy and crowded. And that is the story geographically. Tell me about living in Rome, how you discovered village life. Well, every quarter, it certainly in those days was a village. You lived in, we had a, a, a small penthouse on top of an old palace, and uh, it was a great democracy, the old Rome. In fact, it's, it's called Vecchio Roma, that section where I was, which is not far from the Pantheon. You would have shops at the street level. Then what they call the first floor, we call the second floor, is the Piano Nobile, which is where the nobles lived, and they just had the great painted ceilings and reception rooms and so on. Then there'd be two or three flights levels above that where you'd have well-to-do lawyers and so on in the next level and then above that would be merchants and above that would be workers who would be working in the markets and so on. So in one palace you had every, every class and everybody mingled with everybody else. Everybody spoke dialect and uh, it really was village life all in one palace. Then if you're a quarter, there would be five or six of these palaces, and you'd have five or six little villages, really. And you got to know everybody quite well. You would meet at the chemists, or you would meet in the markets, and uh, everybody kept an eye out on everybody else. And it was village life of a sort that um, was much cheerier, possibly, because I was a foreigner, so they're pleasanter to foreigners but much cheerier, let's say, than uh, Red Hook, New York, which I lived near at one point up the Hudson, which was seething in a way with all sorts of strange emotions. And I found the Roman life was much more natural and more human. Can you tell me about the company Fiore in the mornings? Well, it was paradise. It's full of kids on drugs now, I am told. I haven't been there in some years, but 
used to be. You just came when the produce came in, which would be generally Tuesday morning. Everything would be fresh, and you would you would shop, and uh, there were wine shops all around. And you got to know a lot of people, friends indeed, who would be shopping there too. It was very convivial. I miss that part of Rome. And every Sunday I would walk along the course of Vittorio Emanuele, cross the Tiber over to, on the Vatican side, and go to Santa Cecilia. Where every Sunday there was a concert, and great musicians. And I wouldn't even buy a ticket. I'd just go in and get whatever was available. You said something about um, living in Rome. If you could cross the Campidoglio each day, you would feel content or serene. Could you tell us about that? I've forgotten saying it. <laughs> I don't know what I meant. Because <laughs> we, we did some shots of well, the Campidoglio is a sign of eternal Rome. And uh, it was always felt that as long as the equestrian statue of Marcus Aurelius was in place in that beautiful square designed by Michelangelo, that Rome was safe. Rome could not fall. Then, of course, they took it away to repair it. Now it's back again. We're all nervous. Has it been away too long? And Trattoria life? Well, that used to be wonderful until the buses stopped running. They stopped around 11.30 or 12, and most of the waiters live in the periphery around the city. That's when the palaces began to break up because they got gentrified, so only rich people moved into the palaces. So the waiters, who all lived on the third and fourth floors, uh, had to move out of town which meant that they shut up every restaurant around 11.30 or 12. And the old summer thing of sitting out in the square all night long, was that ended. That was a sad moment when that happened. Is it a conversation city? Well, they talk a lot. They talk a lot. Not like Washington, which Henry James called a city of conversation. Conversation was always very important in Washington. At a very high level, and about real subjects. Roman life is a bit more human, a bit more chatter. Didn't, didn't Henry, Henry uh, Adams call Washington, D.C., the world's grandest zoo? I don't know. Did he say it's interesting, it's called the city of conversation, but what comes up over, you know, time and again in your books is, which is so Jamesian, too, is that it's what's not said. No, oh, yes. Could you... Well, politicians, the secret of politics, at least as practiced in Washington, D.C., is no one says what he means. And if you're about to make a deal, you're a senator and you're making a deal with another senator or with the president, uh, you, you talk in code. Each knows what the other wants, and each knows what he will give and what he won't give. So it'd be just something like, "Oh, lovely to see you. How is Helen? Fine, yeah." You know about, uh, well, you know that postal matter. Yeah, I know about that. Um, George, yes. Well. In what I've just said, a major post office has gone to a major politician. He is now the postmaster of Omaha, Nebraska. And it goes like that. And no more is said than that. Nothing is put in writing. Nothing is. No hand is, is placed upon the Bible. So it, it is all in code. What's the club? Well, I saw, I referred to it in Washington, D.C. It was a group, it's a group of senators who run the Senate, the, the iron law of oligarchy. In Washington, D.C., I refer to the club that runs the Senate. And William Cohen, who is now was Secretary of Defense and was Senator for a long time from Maine, I've read an interview with him, and he said he just read Washington, D.C., and 
He said one thing he really liked about it was that I refer to the club that runs the Senate. She was a, a lot of rather obscure older senators. And he said that Gore Vidal says quite correctly that though no one is quite sure who is a member of the club, everyone knows who is not. <laughs> that was good literary criticism. <laughs>